The most important person on set is yourself, the character that you're about to play, protecting that character, making sure that nothing takes you out of that character. Because a character, I always use this kind of example whenever I'm explaining characters. I use like your wardrobe, right? Um, when, you, when you're about to get into a character, you have to take off yourself first. And then you put that yourself in that wardrobe. And then you take the character out of the wardrobe. And then you put the character on. how to interact, how to make, you know, jokes. I'm, I'm bad with jokes. <laughs> 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 I, I, I'm bad, dog. <laughs> and then... Um, I sound like this, but when I'm on the other side, I'm on I'm on the view, I'm on the bus, you know what I'm saying? But I'm on the other side, and I'm seeing what privilege is, right? And it's fun, and I'm Let me take you through my thinking and my idea of how to put together a movie presentation. close-ups of the onions, of the meat, of the tequila shots, and what that allowed us to do was to take a break from what we were seeing visually. We were taken away from just seeing the actors' faces for a moment to having a break. So it's important for you guys to consider and think about these shots when you're blocking. Let's go to the next one. Next, let's do We've talked about this. Okay, and then we talked about... Okay, stop. Stop there. Okay, we've talked... Um, no, we can skip intimacy scenes. Oh, why? Someone was like, why? Okay, go back to intimacy scenes. <laughs> so, the thing about it, guys, is we, we mustn't be shy from writing in intimacy scenes, but what's very important is making sure that people are very comfortable. Um, making sure that your actors are very comfortable with what you're going to do and how you want to do it. Um, and that takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of planning. It takes very in, uh, important conversations that you have to have with your actors. And what I always do is, I always encourage my actors to contribute. So I always say, how did you imagine the scene? If you had to think about how you would shoot a scene like this, and I ask my actors that question, because it then gives me an idea as a director on how I can push it. Uh, let's go to the next scene. Okay, this is a movie that I'm working on. It says Matrix versus Zombies. Uh, it's called Rage. Um, so I had this idea, you know that party that they have in Durban at the end of the year, the kids? It's called Rage, eh? <laughs> So it's called Rage. <laughs> so I had an idea about a zombie outbreak um, at Rage. And I thought about like, what if you had a group of these kids, these four or five kids who were friends, that all went to Rage and um, suddenly this like, zombie outbreak happens. Um, so let me take you through my thinking and my idea of how to put together a movie presentation. But before I do that, I'm going to ask for us to take a short 15 minute break, 10 minute break, 
there's popcorn outside, uh, slash puppy, but of all straws. Um, so we'll go and grab those, and then come back with the notes and we'll continue. There's a zombie breakout. And when you put together like uh, a presentation for a movie, it's always good to set up the premise, the world, and what the stakes are. Um, you know, you need to kind of include the exciting incident, like what actually happens in the story uh, to drive the story forward and it gives the people a hope. So, Four teenage misfits attending the lethal rage stumble upon a zombie outbreak and they must join forces to stop the disaster from uh, turning the festival into a national pandemic. Rage is a teenage comedy drama set in the vibrant world of the lethal, blending the powerful youth genre of horror with the coming of age narrative. Imagine and then you kind of give examples of what the movie's about. So with happiness, the four letter word, you'd say, uh, imagine sex in the city means uh, insecure, for example. <clears throat> um, each character embarks on a personal journey. One must find courage, another must find purpose, the third one must find his heart, while the fourth searches for the sense of belonging. In the end, they all realize that everything that they've been looking for was within them all along. All right. And then let's go to the next slide. And then you set up the world, right? So when you set up the world, I've got a really great image there of uh, the zombie outbreak. And then I've got an image of the party and the atmosphere and the vibrancy of the world. So it's important to put that setting up. And next. As you can see there, what I also think Rage is good for is the music, because I also think that we can feature a lot of musicians, um, the likes of A-list celebrities um, that can make cameo appearances in the film, things like that. So it's got a marketable angle, it's got a social angle, because it's current, it's today, and it's happening right now. Next. And then, um, you know, mood board, mood board references of like, what does it feel like? What's the, what's the feeling? What's the tone? What's the currency? What's the fiber of the film? And you can do that with putting a lot of references together. Next. And next. Okay, so, sorry, I know you said I'm gonna sit, man, I understand. <laughs> So, okay, so um, this is my opening. This is how it opens, right? So imagine these flashing lights. You see this colored stage, smoke, special effects, full the scene, aggressive music players in the background. And then the camera captures the mosh pit that's taking place. So you can imagine this camera. <coughs> It started from the back of the DJ and like there's a mosh pit that's happening and these guys are throwing each other around. And as these guys are throwing each other around, the energy is electric, the noise is overwhelming, uh, but something is happening, there's something that is happening. Suddenly, uh, a mosher is then splattered with blood. <laughs> you just see this blood that gets sprayed on someone. And then the second person, blood, draw. third person, blood, do, 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 cuts the music, do, 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 do. and this blood is starting to splash on people's faces, right? Then suddenly you have this character who raises her arm, and as she raises her arm, you realize that the arm has been bitten off by something, and she starts to scream, ah, right? But now you've also got the distraction of the right? Can you guys imagine this? Yeah. yeah. The picture of this, right? Yeah. Then amidst the chaos, <clears throat> so like Moses opening the sea, like Moses parting the sea, suddenly you start to see this figure. He's holding a baseball bat. He's got this baseball bat, and the baseball bat's got blood on it, and this kid is like angry, right? Because what you imagine by the communication that there's already blood on his baseball bat is that he's been killing that, right? And he pushes through, 
the crowd and he's going to where all the blood splatting is happening. More blood splatting and he cuts this character who's part of the seas and then he goes to the character who's turned into a zombie, right? And this zombie turns around and as the zombie turns around, our character takes a baseball bat and just like takes his head off, bang, with the hip. And you see the zombie head flying through the air, cut to so that's kind of the opening of the film. Go to the next slide. And then I put together a concept trailer. So you ask yourself what's a concept trailer. Concept trailer is when you get different scenes from different movies, from different music videos, from different films. Can be local, can be, in fact, a lot of the time it's not local, it's international stuff. And then you cut together a sizzler of the best moments of your movie. All right, so let's watch this. I'm the man, I got plans. Put the bourbon in my hand, that'll make it change the stance. So I'm like, I'm just saying, in the lane, so I'm back up to the man. Then my car in front of the van, but I'm driving like I ran. I'm like, damn, see you tweaking on the brand. I can never understand how you claim to be a man. Simples from different times, and I kind of wanted to give people the feeling or a sense of what this, the tone of this film would all be about, right? And then uh, go to the next slide, and then you do your character bios, right? So, what's nice about this is you've got different kinds of characters, um, and you put a mood board for those character bios. So, you've got a guy called Stuart, his wife, kid from Craig Hall, Johannesburg, raised by his parents. You've got Kaya. Otherwise known as Kezi. Next slide. Uh, you've got Mads, uh, Indian boy, and then you've got Denzel. So those are the four characters that the movie centers around. Then you, you have to write your character bios. What are your character bios? Um, your character bios are who your character is, what your character believes in, the obstacle that that character is going to face, the challenge that that character is going to face and what they have to overcome. So, as you can see, with Gen with, let's read Denzel's one. Denzel is a gentle giant from Richards Bay, grappling with his ideas of masculinity. Despite his imposing physique and his role as a rugby player, he struggles with social anxiety and has a deep desire to be recognized for more than just his size. Rage becomes a fueling point for, a turning point for Denzel, where he learns to embrace his life uh, and his true self and steps out of the shadows, finding confidence and his self-worth. So you write those character bios and you put them together so that your audience can have an idea or your, uh, your, your viewers can have an idea of who are they following in the story. Okay, then next. Then uh, Leila just has a cameo. And then you've got the hook. At the dawn of a zombie pandemic, our characters must learn to see each other's strengths and also unite to stop the virus from spreading further in this newfound alliance. Remember, I applied for psychology and then I did it for three months. I was like, hey, my head. I, I don't know, uh, I'm Gizu, I said it, it. And then I took a gap here, uh, and then I applied for uh, drama studies at DUT. And that's where it started. We used to do like theater most of the time. And I was also interested in, in learning, le le learning about TV, uh, film, um, 
all of that, and there were, there were people that we used to work with, especially from com commercials, um, scholars and gentlemen. Was, was one of, I, don't, I don't know if Tabak knows them there from Supersport. They do like Supersport mostly. Sure, man. And then we worked with them uh, for like rugby adverts. That's where I started like <coughs> doing like film and stuff like that. So I was very curious in, in learning about like different platforms in the film industry, you understand, know, and the business side of it. Because I think if you go to, because the soccer is talented, that is, but if you go to uh, DUT, you, 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 you get an opportunity to learn about the business side of, of the industry that we are in, right? And that's the most important thing, and discipline. Because I think a lot of people, if they are given an opportunity, they don't have discipline, you understand, to grab it and make use of it. So, <clears throat> I will tell you a story. Uh, I used to be a bartender while I was studying, and I would research on how to be a bartender, mixing drinks. I, I, I didn't have a clue. I How do you interact with your customers and stuff like that? So, I, I've, I've learned uh, on YouTube, the food, uh, like how to interact, how to make you know, jokes, I'm, I'm bad with jokes. <laughs> 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 I, I, I'm bad, dumb. <laughs> and then, um, during the course of that, uh, um, um, oh, me learning how to interact with people, you know, I've met people in the industry. Like, I'm a producer, I've been there, uh, the one uh, that was on ETV, um, they've, they gave me an opportunity, you understand? That's how you, I've learned how do you like treat people? Yeah, we must change our way. But they will say, "Um, treat them well." Right? Do do you understand? So that's where it, it, it's all started as well. Because um, with the discipline, it will take you far. Do you understand? So yeah, and uh, much cut short though. <laughs> Oh, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just so nervous. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, my name is Annelisa. Um, how did I get into the thing? I think I represent um, the science of drama, I think. And I think where I'm coming from right now is to share as much as I have, or at least share what I've learned for this process. Um, I started also in primary school, I was with King Herod. Um, I was four, so I've got 37 years of dramatic experience. <laughs> so my mission is, um, I'm here to defend the drama and to resolve the dramatic tension. So I started when I was four, and then I went into primary school and we did that, we did music and drama, and then we went to high school and then we started interacting with Stanislavski and the written word about what the thing actually is. Really seeing the tunnels, the stuff of the text, of the, the drama. Understand, I sound like this, but I'm one of you, I'm one of us, do you know what I'm saying? But I'm on the other side and I'm seeing what privilege is, right? And it's fun and I'm enjoying it. After that, I uh, did the theme programs, the Eisteddfords, went to university, did well over there, um, learned about the stuff, wrote about it, defended it, got into it, got out into the industry, got an agent. Tabang and I met, we have the longest professional relationship of the people that I've ever worked with. We met when I was in third year. We were both in third year. I didn't get a role that I auditioned for because he said, nah, man, this cat's too pretty. <laughs> it's too pretty. That was the first time I didn't get a role because I was too pretty. <laughs> so I played a, a clean thug. He put me in a, a red shirt and I had a little Beretta type gun thing and I killed some friends of ours. <laughs> so that was nice. That was third year. Just to talk about journey, process, continuity, repetition. Because that's the thing that I represent. Up from, from the time I did my theatre all the way through television, film, animation, music, musical, all of the stuff, I learned it and I used it and I shared it from a display point of view. 
And there was um, a childishness about that for me in that I'm going to go away just now. I say that to my students all here in the room. I'm going to die tomorrow and I say that intentionally so that today I have a responsibility to hand over as clearly as I can what I've accumulated because that time wasn't, it's not mine. I've got 37 years that I'm sitting on, it's not mine. How do I explain that on the other side? I didn't hand over anything. Look at how much I have. Look at how much I have. So I have a responsibility to do that, to say, Shab, when you come to me and you say, I'm willing to do this and I have that, then we can take you to these cats. Right? So that's what I'm doing. Powerful. Powerful, powerful. Before I come in with, my, with more questions, I want to open up the floor because I know you guys will have a lot of questions. Let's keep it to a general on acting, on performance, on the journey, on continuity. Uh, and then the guys will decide what they hone in on. So yeah, let me open up the floor. Who's first? First up, right, right at the back. Yes, you. That mic, that mic will never work. Give it up on that. One, two, one, two. Okay. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Apiwe. I am an actor student, second year actor student, <coughs> and I'm majoring in directing and producing. So the reason why I want to ask um, you guys this question is I noticed that on set, the working environment that a producer would have to set affects an actor's performance. And I noticed that it might happen so easily because actors can feel neglected or maybe there's chaos on set that affects you. So I wanted to ask, what is the most important thing that production needs to look out for in order to make your working environment comfortable enough for you to put on the best performance? You know, that's such a um, controversial question. Uh, I can only answer it based on how we react to it. Um, you know, I ha I've had the privilege of working with um, some some really, really amazing veterans. And that means, because I like to people watch, and so I watch how they react whenever they find themselves in a situation where it's not favorable for them to deliver a performance. And what I've noticed is that they always put the work first, right? Why are we there? We're there to bring out the best. And based on our histories and based on of our experience, we know that there will always be turmoil, there will always be challenges. And I know production will always try their best to make sure that we deliver and they deliver the best that they can as well. The most impo important person on set is yourself, the character that you're about to play, protecting that character, making sure that nothing takes you out of that character. Because a character, I always use this kind of example whenever I'm explaining characters, I use like your wardrobe, right? Um, when, you, when you're about to get into a character, you have to take off yourself first. And then you put that yourself in that wardrobe. And then you take the character out of the wardrobe. And then you put the character on. And then you go to set. Or if your process is doing it on set, it's fine, because this is all mental, right? Um, you have to continuously protect that character. If you participate in politics of set, that means now you're outside of the character. You're bringing in Usandi into the character. Now you're not being true, and you'll miss out on a lot of beautiful moments. It's, you know? So I think, I hope I answered your question as best as an actor's perspective can. Yeah, I mean, I think from my side, it's, uh, it's I prep from home, you know, because I don't think that we have, like, uh, um, Kinga at the moment, you know, uh, I think like most productions are given like given like limited budgets for that. So I think <coughs> what you need to do because you wanna and in, in, in some productions I guess we totally green room or, or your your your, your own space where you you wake up in the morning, go to your um, room and prep, you know, um, just getting you getting into the moment. You understand? We don't have um, that um, opportunity to understand as actors. So what I do is I prep from home. I try to rehearse or try to 
meet up with um, ooh, 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 my, 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 my brother here to just help me, you know, prep um, for tomorrow. So I think that's what I do because you don't have it for now. Yeah. So what's great about you, Anadis, is you also have an opportunity to work with other actors, uh, with um, workshops and helping them prepare and talking about, just on Gwenzo's point about prep. Please talk to me about the importance and I think it's a general, I don't think it's just for actors as a whole, I think it's in whichever discipline, just the importance of being prepared and the importance of continuity in your preparation. Thanks, Saban. Um, I like to always try, to, I, I, I like to look at the scientific element of what this acting thing is. I'm always very intrigued by doctors and other professionals who will talk to you about the aorta and the lymphatic system or whatever the things are, the nice jargon things. And I always felt that it was very difficult for us because we can't even define what a character is, where do we find it? So in this study that we do, it's very important that you equip yourself with as much information as you can find. And that appeals as, or it appears as text analysis. You're finding this information on the, on the document to give you confidence so that when you are out there and the conditions are not to your pleasure, you've got something to focus on because this character is here to defend the drama outside of you, right? And the more you know, the better you can paint because we're artists. You get so caught up in, oh, my line and this and that. We want to disappear. We were afforded opportunities on screen to disappear because we were able to meet them at 100%. Take two is not necessary, but we're going to take it to take three because we've got three 100% because we were able to meet each other at our professional best for the limited time that we have because we're always chasing the sun. I'm a painter, I'm an artist, you can see it. I take pride in that, but it's not a talent, it's preparation. You can do it, we can do it. That's what it is. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask Oguti. First, Oguti, how do you keep yourself going? Because sometimes, in seven years now, you're maybe for two years, five years, Augaga Kastwa. How do you keep yourself running and keep the fire in you burning every time? Because you can't wait for an opportunity, then that's when you start to be in the Eighteen system, how do you keep yourself running? Two, how do you get the casting directors to like you? Serious. Because it's a lot, but if you get oh another one. Lord, I get a brief, ne? please audition. It's only a slide, and my lines is just only two lines. How do I give life to this script with no character background and just one slide? And they say at two, uh, maybe ten a.m. tomorrow they need you in Bram, my drama experience. How do I give life to this character? Thank you. Okay, um, can I answer the question three? I, I, I want to take that one. Uh, you know, well, with auditions, most of the time they do give you a character bio. Um, and I'd like, because it's, you know, it's a master class, I'd like to take you guys through something like that. Uh, can we please go back to the slides of the character bios? Um, whoever's was controlling the, there were slides, that just previously I saw them. Oh, oh, 
Oh, oh snap, sorry, sorry. Um, okay, then we'll, we'll start from now. I'll answer quickly um, question one. We, we all go through it. I won't lie to you. It's not that we're always securing jobs. Um, it's, it's tough. You, you said it, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, one of the biggest things that I've learned is that, and I'll, I'll talk from my personal experience, is that you have to have these core values inside of you, something to like, to anchor in on. Because, look, rejection is there. We all, we all get rejected. Even now, like, you'd send in 10 self-tapes. And previously, Abu Lindo was saying, Uguzi, it's not that you sucked or anything like that. It just wasn't for you, you know? Yeah. And I think it's important to understand that the rejection is everywhere, you know? You just have to have those core, core values and those core, those rituals. I mean, I, when I was starting out, I had serious, serious, I mean, it sucks that I, it, it's kind of lacking right now, I'll explain. But I had like serious, I was really serious with myself, right? Like, I'd, I'd have a to-do list to the core. I'd make sure that my mind is, is, is sharp enough to handle rejection. I'd be reading, uh, I've watched the top 250 IMB, IMDB movies just to get myself, you know, just to keep yourself in, in check and keep yourself, you know, running, just to feel like you're progressing, you know? If you have a to-do list from Monday to Friday, you've done a lot. Yeah. So you're not focusing on what you didn't get. You're yeah. still going forward. Um, yes, I would like us to go to the next slide, um, please. Then let's talk about Denzel or Denzel Lamb. Yeah. So as we reach here, Den Denzel, 18, is a gentle giant from Richards Bay, grappling with his I ideas of masculinity. Despite his imposing physique and role as a rugby player, he struggles with social anxiety and a deep desire to be recognized for more than just his size, you know? So I think if we look at that as the character bio, there's a lot there. Um, they were talking from the producer's side of things and the director's side of things uh, to, to, to tell the story to the audience. Now as an actor, when I see that, I have to look at his, what we call flaws, and ask ourselves, why? Why is he grappling with ideas of masculinity? We know how masculinity is, right? So we ask ourselves, why is he grappling with it? Maybe because of his dad. He's not written, dad is not written up there. You have to piece this together. Um, he struggles with social anxiety. Why? Why does he suffer from social anxiety? Maybe because he's always been too big. Those are the things that you have to ask yourself as you're reading this and then answer those questions because that's how you develop the character. Uh, my acting coach taught me that the, mo the biggest issue, the biggest flaw that a lot of actors have, she speaks that way, I'm sorry, I don't, <laughs> is that they walk into the scene as if the character had just been born. That's problematic. We have to reverse time. Your, your character walks in, but where was he just now? We rewind. Rewind continually, continually. It's, it's a process, right? Every actor has their own process. But yeah, he walks into the scene. Where was he just now? He came down from downstairs. He was driving. Somebody cut him off. He, so we reverse him slowly, slowly, and then fast, 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 back to his childhood, back into the womb. And then we play it again, forward. We play it forward, being born. How was his childhood? Who, who acted funny? Did he have a crush? Were they, you know? putting these things, these trigger moments, into the story. And then, by that time, by the time you get to that scene, you have now realized that you, oh wow, okay, I've embodied the character. And once you embody the character, then it makes it easier because then you, have, you don't have to think when you're on set. You don't have to think, what would my character do? You've embodied him, you just be now, you know? So yeah, that's just, yeah. The second question was, how do you get casting directors to like you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you get uh, casting directors to like I mean, I think you just need to impress them, you know. Come prepared, you know, just do your job. Angeba has never been my choice but to like you, you understand? So it, it, just come prepared, you know. Um, I'd just like to touch on the um, fire burning. How do you keep the fire burning? I'd like to do this by way of an exercise, okay? Mm -hmm. I anticipate this room is full of actors. Yeah. 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 You yeah. need to identify yourselves when you see yourself in the mirror. 
Is this room, if, is this room full of actors? Yeah. Yeah. That's a little better. You might win an Oscar. Is this room full of actors? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, actors. Okay, we're gonna we we, we got Tabangule right here, and we got these people over here, right? Who's ready to go on to set tomorrow? Raise your hand. In three, two, keep your hands up. Three, two, one, and cut. Everybody who's got their hands up, stand up. I forgot to mention this is a trick, okay? This is, this is my point. We've got, say, let's say we've got 20 people standing up, all right? Of everybody standing up ready to perform tomorrow because we're solving problems about performance. How do I get this? How do I get that? Somebody show me something. If this was a sing-along and you're saying you're all singers, somebody sing me a song now. In three, two, one, action. Okay, cut. Cut, cut, cut. Forgive the example, you may sit. The example is this. If we are ready to perform, we should be able to have a piece of performance with us all the time. Yeah. Right? And not just one, because Sabang is going to say, mm, I see that you can do this, but I don't, I don't have a, a role like this. Do you, can you do something softer? Can you do something like this? And that's what's going to get the casting director to like you. I auditioned for Women King, and they didn't have the right part. So I said to them, if we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious spot while around us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mark at our accursed lot. They said, that's a bit, um, that's a bit hectic. Can you give us something soft here? I said, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? How <laughs> more lovely and more temperate. They said, we can work with this guy because he's ready. How do I keep the fire burning? I need material that I can practice with that's going to give me the confidence to show these guys that I can do this thing. Denzel's going to meet you there at the airport because you're going places, but you're going to have nothing to show him. So pick up your confidence with something. You find poetry, you find monologues, you let go of the excuses, you go find it. I found this thing. Don't write the pieces. That's a different class. Find other, pe other people's excellence. Practice that excellence. Crunch it, make it soft. Disappear into it. If you eat the words, you will disappear because you don't speak like your character. That is character. Character is represented by the words on the page. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? I don't speak like that. When I... Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? <laughs> it's not me. I change my voice, I characterize on top of it, but I don't create that character. I understand what, how do I deal with a piece that doesn't have a bio? I interpret the piece. I wandered lonely as a cloud that flows on high or veils and hills when all at once I saw a crowd a host of golden daffodils. William Wordsworth, 1800s. You could trap with it. It's an interpretation. You gain confidence from doing difficult things. They're gonna love you for it. Because it's not about them, it's about us loving you. Can we believe the truth of what you are saying? Find truth in the most unnatural places and we will believe you. How hard is this panel? Hard as fuck! All right, we got some more questions. Who's next? Yes. Yes, you, lady, yes. Yes, you, and then the guy with the cap. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. Um, my question is just on self-tapes. Um, I just wanted to know how you guys handle self-tapes, because sometimes I find that I struggle with them, because if I have to keep on Sometimes you know you make a mistake and you're like, oh, okay, could have been better. Then you have to keep on switching it on and off and on and off. Yeah. So, how do you guys uh, handle that? And how do you guys feel about them in general? <laughs> <laughs> Why does it start with me? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, we sell the stuff. <laughs> So cell tapes are a problem. They do two things. On, on the business side, you just come to us and we'll do your cell tapes for you. And why we do that, what we say is, you do the prep and we'll then shoot for you. You've got a professional actor who's going to do, we simulate that work, that environment for you, 
right? But you have to meet us at that professional level. That's that. That's the service, okay? But what you are doing when you are doing a self-tape at home is you're understanding the world that you're creating outside of the world that you're going in. Is my lighting hard enough? Is it soft enough? Is it warm enough? You're becoming sensitive to color, to environment, to is my wall the right texture? Do, am I playing depth? What are my angles? Where are my eye lines? Where am I playing? What is my belief structure? Who am I? Where am I coming from? What's my history? What's my favorite color? All of these things, and then I frame them, right? Technically, my phone is portrait. That's the wrong thing. Your TV is landscape. Understanding that aspect ratio. Right? You're getting to learn all of that stuff. I try to make this performance the TV performance. You work on relationship, you work on various different things. That's what you learn from a technical point of view. Because tomorrow you're going to be sitting outside and looking at that shot and saying something's not right. You're going to be using words like it's too soft, it's not warm enough, it's too cold, I'm not getting the right feel, the vibe is not good because you're starting to work with your feelings because Atta, you're a feeler, right? You are practicing that. It's your sensitivity, it's your intuition. Right? So on the technical, you are a drama technician. You can set up a light, you can set up a thing, plug a mic in, because tomorrow I'm going to mic you. And you're going to mic me and it's going to buzz and I know which it's my movement, I'm moving too much, I'm fiddling with my tie because I've done it in the tape. It's your training, it's part of it. Once you've set it up, I want to see it on my TikTok. Come on. We want you to train. But we want you to do the work. It teaches you that you're content producers, but you're not seeing that you are actor producers, creating your own work to generate your own things so that you can compete and become the next yeah. TV king. Ah. <laughs> There's a lot of responsibility on you, Black Child, you understand? Yeah. We've got a lot to do. And the whole thing of us competing with each other and pushing each other apart, look at this brotherhood. Yeah. Right? Mm. Sometimes we got it and sometimes we don't. He bought me bread. I bought him a car. <laughs> right? So that's the stuff. The self tape is to enhance you as a technician and then it's to facilitate the world that you're playing inside so that you understand the inside and the outside of it. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, word. <laughs> word, word, yeah. Hey guys, um, what do you do for us? No, 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 no. Yeah, um, yeah, self tapes were difficult starting out because, you know, we, we're just so used to being in the presence of the casting director, uh, in the presence of someone who can actually read. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it's just different now, but you just have to adjust, right? It's like you really have to adapt. Uh, this game is all about adaptability. Um, self tapes, for me, I had to learn to, like he said, really create the world in my head. And as, as, as crazy as that sounds, it really does help. Like really, really, like read the scene, right? And, and don't rush to read the scene. Read to understand what the scene is about. What's happening in this scene? Literally, what's the intention? If there's the first person who, because who, who, there'll always be a person who wants something in the scene. So what does this person want? What is the intention? And where are we? Because they always say, int, um, you know, it'll be like night in somebody's apartment. What does that mean? In, in, in the restaurant. What does that mean? You know, if you deliver something and it's, it's, I fucking love you, right? In a room, I fucking love you. In a restaurant, fucking, you know, just being around. <laughs> fucking, what are you doing, you know? So you just really have to put yourself in that, in that world because you know you don't have uh, uh, the person who'd be like, do you want to try it again, you know? And about the whole thing when you're watching it, and I've realized, uh, what, you know, self tapes. When you're watching it and you go, eh, you know, it just, it just. Sometimes we overjudge ourselves as well because we forget that uh, is is you judging yourself. You know, sometimes if you're really in the world, you'll deliver, and that thing that you find ill could be a an actual nuance that is liked. You know, and that's the difficulty about self tapes, man. Um, because you're always so critical about yourself, knowing that you don't know that much and you don't know what the director might like. Uh, we want to make it so perfect that it's too polished, you know, that you can't, the person has no character. My first question is about being an extra. Because I tell you to stop as English, that's where we start by being an extra. But how do you push from that? You know, that's like, you know, one step forward, but how do you fully? go through that door and become, you know, the main or the side uh, characters. And then my second question, 
Oh, yes. <laughs> connections. How do you maintain the connections that you have on set, like, beyond that? You know, more say Kai and stuff like that. How do you retain that and maintain that? For example, if you are liked by the producer or the director or whoever, you know, how do you maintain that connection and talk to them and have them think about you when they have the next movie coming up or, you know, an audition or stuff like that? Thank you. Um, hello, Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to say that. Um, cool. I'm gonna try and give it in bullet for in, in in bullet points. <sighs> Extra work is good. It is your first point of entry as an actor. Mm. You're a background performer. You are practicing without the pressure of having to carry a story. You're observing how to be alive in a moment when somebody else is being alive. You're part of a world. You're not there to mess around. You should have a book, you're writing notes. Oh, look at how he's doing this, look at how they're doing that. You should know all of those things because you are head of department. Mm -hmm. The character is in your hands from, from the onset, the beginning over here. You are playing subtext. We never hear you, but your thoughts have to be real. That world is real. That's, the, that's how you look at it. Don't look down on it. Because it's going to give you money that you don't have. That money you take, you save, and you put that money into training. You come to drama tech, right? We talk about this stuff. I want to become a better actor. Through our interaction, then you are able to bet on yourself in castings where then you get bigger roles because you've got the experience. You can stand in front of people. You're constantly defending yourself as an artist to yourself because you believe in yourself as an artist. You're not, oh, I'm just doing extra work. No, you're important in the scene. You are a lead. It's just that you are playing it inside your head and the actors over there are your extras. You have to create it. It's important. Don't look down on it. It's better than what we've got. Everybody, you can't dictate how you get in. Okay? Um, and how you maintain relationships, that's how you maintain relationships. Hey, I remember you, weren't you? Yeah, weren't you? Hey, look at you. Hey, it's that progression. It's not you. It's, it's the, the, your journey to greatness. Because I keep checking, yo, you keep pulling, turning up. You keep doing the thing. Then I remember you. It's not about me as a producer finding favor, or you, or whatever. It's about your work. Don't trade your favor for my liking. It's your work. Somebody's got to say it. Your, 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 your work will defend you. If you can do it, there's nothing anybody can take away from you. Your work stands. You can walk away if you, if you don't like the deal. Right? That's what it is. Hey, I'm Chef Boots. So I want to add on the um, extra things before. Um, yes, there is no big or small role, but um, I don't like the treatment. I wish we can like fix that on the scene of ourselves. And my question is, um, how do you guys get into character? And how do you detach, especially um, if you are, um, especially if you are playing a role that's traumatic? So how do you like get yourself out and be was around um, uh, what type of stories uh, people want to be hearing. Um, I actually think there's a bit of a crisis um, at the moment around this, and I don't know if broadcasters are really getting it right, to be honest. Um, I'm definitely not watching anything that I feel very connected or inspired by. I'm actually going back and watching older things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think how we at Ceruti, how we like to work, and I'll probably just give you some insight into like our DNA. We always want to see like where the conversation is right now in the country and then try and create entertainment around that. So a project like The Herd, I'm sure you've all watched it. <laughs> 
Um, so the herd um, was, our insight at that time was, there's this conversation about land. We're not gonna go out and make a political statement about it, but it does feel like this is something that people really wanna engage on. So we made a story about a black family who had built this legacy, and the dad wanting at all costs, <laughs> that's where the entertainment comes in, to um, make sure that his family understands what that legacy is about so he can hand it over to the next generation. Um, and I think it did incredibly well for that time slot because we were tapping into a conversation that hadn't been had yet. Um, similar with Gomorrah, when we made Gomorrah, our insight was this idea that, you know, you can get yourself out of the hood, but you're always living like one paycheck out. Um, and that there's this thing that if that gets taken away from you, you might need to move back. And what would your life look like? Especially our new character, again, this is entertainment. <laughs> so she had moved out, she had this amazing Santa wealthy lifestyle, and she loses it all in one night. And she needs to go back home. So I think the reason why those shows perform well is because we're tapping into real universal stories that relate to where the conversation is at the moment. And I'd like to see us be able to make those kinds of stories more when broadcasters, I think, start understanding what we need. How good is she? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got a question here. Yeah? Uh, please stand. I think that's like narrowed down to um, when you're creating an idea, and even with what Tanya just showed us with Rage, right? When you're pitching an idea to a broadcaster or to anybody, it's about how do you engage them on that, right? Because you're selling them an idea um, and you're asking people for money, but you need to understand how you're connecting that story to something down the line. Um, so yeah, you have to understand your audience. Right at the back. You're going to have to stand and project please, brother. Oh, hello. Hi. 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 Um, I have a question for Leanne, why Um And I, I'm aware of um, Lindo's film, The Umbrella and the Wolf. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah. I just wanted to find out about like practical models to look at um, financing that also enable you to also um, maintain your IP. Because I understand that um, you know went through DFMI and I, I think that's Red Sea that financed the form. I don't know what the contracts are regarding that ownership of IP, but I'm, I'm very curious about like um, Africans, I think also really speaking about us telling our stories, I think um, a conversation has to also come about us owning our stories. Mm -hmm. And I think as young people, we see Taban making um, Netflix stuff, and we're like, yo, I really want to make a Netflix piece, but we don't know the structures of that. And most of the stuff that's on Netflix is commissioned, and you don't own the work, right? So I'm very curious about like the practical, like where, I mean, Lilo is really young, so to be directing a film which like wouldn't be normal like 20 years ago, now he's directing a film, which means that maybe also me, in a few years I could be directing a film. But like, I'm very curious about the practical places, like the programs, where do I look for the program, where do I, where do I, um, yeah, where do I look for the programs, is there a website that I can see of funding or fellowships or residencies where I can actually go develop my story. So that, yeah, just the whole, the, the financing models, because I think we saw this NFDF um, that in only NFBF can finance at home. And I think there are so many finance spots that we just don't know about. So I'm very curious of where to find those and those programs. Um, I'm also going to point out something different about the two directors on stage. So when Tabang made his first feature, which was Happiness, is a four letter word, right? 
there, there was like no first time director that was ever gonna be able to make that kind of film, right? Um, and his first feature was a commercial feature. Um, and if you look at what was happening in the industry at that time, the only way to make movies was through that um, model of letting the investors take all the IP, etc. But look at the career that he has made from that opportunity. So he never turned out an opportunity. Because I think, and, and Lindo said this, like everybody's journey is going to look different, right? Um, and I think Tabang has gone on and he's really done so much with that platform. I mean, we're all sitting here because of what he's done with his platform. So I think you also need to be wise in your career around which opportunities you jump at. And that made total sense for him and maybe he'll comment on that after this. Whereas uh, with Lindo, the industry is very different where we are right now. There is a bigger appetite from international investors for African content. And that only really started to happen. I mean, I don't know if it's related to Wakanda, but. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, with many talks, so like when they started to see that, like, African, um, that there was an appetite for African material, it has become a lot easier for us to pitch ideas that we never, we couldn't have pitched before. So he's making a genre piece. Um, and there's a huge appetite in the market for that kind of content as well, and people are very excited about the kind of movie that he's making. So he will have a very different first form to Tabang. I don't know if you guys want to comment on that. Thank you, Lee. I think that's a very good question, and I think Lee's point is quite important to think about, is that don't get too caught up with wanting to own that it stops you from actually working. There's nothing wrong with wanting to own yourself, but don't be, if someone gives you an opportunity and says, I'm gonna give you this film, but I'm gonna give you the series, but it's gonna be straight commissioned, and then you chase a journey of wanting to own it for the next five years, where you could have made it five years ago, you must just be careful that it doesn't cripple you. Maybe there's things down the line where you say, actually, let me build a case study of my work, let me build a case study of my reputation and my name, and then let me get into a phase where I'm gonna start owning stuff. And that's a very long journey. Um, I'd like to ask Lindo just on the same kind of topic, just about his first feature film and why he's doing a genre piece. Uh, uh, so, I, I love genre. Uh, I, I, I leaned on it in after because I didn't feel that I was good at like dramatic stuff. I couldn't do the the thing where I made an actress cry in her bed because she's like, I can't do that stuff. Um, but I love genre because of what it tells us about us. Um, so I always, and I love old films. So I, the when it comes time to think about your first movie, you make. I've, I've been two years in commercials and. I, when it comes time to think about your first movie, you start just wanting to make a movie that's like movies that you like. Um, and I grew up watching those old um, monster movies on TCM, Wolfman, uh, Frankenstein, and I wanted to do that here. Um, and, and, and so I came up with this idea about a kid, a group of kids in a community who go out and hunt a werewolf that's killing people in their community. Um, and the reason I want to tell that story is because we don't see black faces in the golden age of cinema. Uh, Singing in the Rain, 42nd Street, like all our favorite old movies don't have black faces. And so I just wanted to make something that fits in that world, but has people who look like us speaking our languages. And you almost imagine that the actors on my movie would leave their set and have a cigarette with Gene Kelly, like afterwards. Like I wanted to make something that felt like it's from the 1950s, but speaks to today, and, and I think genre is a great way to tell that story. Um, it's also a great way to get you through the door. Uh, Dovas asked about like the specific structures on like funding models and things like that, and, and, and obviously Leanne is the money person, um, but the thing that I realized was when we went to DFM last year, everybody pitched, we were the, I think we were like one of the only people who pitched like a movie that was like fun, it's like 
let's wave all past these kids, you know, like, there's gonna be some deaths, like, it's gonna be cool. <laughs> and then, it's like, the other guys before us are like, this is a story about South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and how poverty plays a role. And it's like, yo, I'm not that smart, I just wanna see a werewolf kill some people. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think we, we and, then, and, and you realize, and then, you know, you sit down with the people who have the money, and the first thing, in our first meeting, the first guy sits down and goes, Guys, I don't care what people are saying about your movie. It's good. I think it's going to be good. I was like, what are they saying? <laughs> and you realize it's not commercial enough. And so there's different sides of the funding model, right? There's the Netflix side where you can go to them. And even Active last year, a Netflix guy walked up to me and was like, dude, if your film was in color, I'll take it. But it's in black and white. And like, what am I going to do with a black and white movie? So then you go in different rooms and you say, hey, private guy in London who funds weird movies. This is my little werewolf movie. It's 70% Zulu. Uh, it's in black and white, no one's going to watch it. Do you, sure, I'll give you a million dollars. Um, and so you have to find different, there's different avenues for different kinds of movies. Um, T is very much our Michael Bay. He's never going to struggle to make the cash, to make the movie, because he made the biggest African film of all time. Um, and I learned that you have to know your audience from him, but at the same time, I can't do what he did. Uh, only T can shoot the way T, you should see him on set, it's crazy. <laughs> and only T can shoot that way, and, and the lesson I'm learning is that as much as I want to make a movie for me, uh, as much as in my DNA, when you're asking people for money, there's little things you have to concede on. Okay, maybe I'll do a color version. Okay, maybe it'll be 50% English. Okay, maybe the, we won't see the werewolf in every scene. Maybe, you know, and you start to make concessions depending on who comes on board. But every single film festival in the entire world, and every major city has a film festival, has a market attached to it where people are looking to buy and sell movies. So whenever you see there's a film festival, there's definitely a market, and there's definitely a weird European guy who will offer you millions of dollars for you to make your way with you. Okay. okay, guys, two more. Whoa. Okay, I'm gonna take... Whoa. <laughs> We've got another panel, guys, so unfortunately I can only take three more questions. That gentleman over there. For me, I want to talk about the economy of economies, and what I mean by that is, I think we are in this whole group of like trying to prop up and stabilize black directing, black cinematography in the country, right? And also the ownership of black production houses. But where I want to go is, um, say for instance, as are you guys maybe looking directly into saying, we need people that do music, um, we need people that edit, uh, we need companies that cast. Uh, how far do you guys go into supporting startup companies that are supplying you guys with the different aspects of services that, we, that, that you need? And how does one then engage you to say, if I'm a person who's casting, you know, if I'm a music producer, but I would like to score for you guys? Because I feel like there was a time in film where film was so integrated in South Africa, you'd see a guy who's a white or star acting in a movie, or you would hear his song in that particular piece of movie. And also, you know, there are casting agencies of, of, of younger people that would like to work with you guys. So how do, how do we approach you? Is it still the typical model of saying we're gonna fill out a supplier form to Siriti? Um, or are you guys still using the guys that are sort of, you know, established in the space? So are you starting your own, you know, sort of base of suppliers or using the, the ones that are already established? And I think the other one that I would like to ask is, um, I think a lot of people that are here might be musicians themselves. Uh, we hear that there's music that is being licensed to you guys as a production, for your Netflix production. Um, uh, how do we then start that conversation to come to you to say, we have this you know, catalog of music that we think you can be able to use in your phone? Um, yeah, I think those would be uh, my two questions. And just a warning to the young creatives in here. The room is full, but maybe half of you will survive this industry. <laughs> Okay, um, I think um, on the music question specifically, um, and I, it's something we've also sort of touched on, um, I think you need to look at every opportunity that you have at your disposal. So, like, for us, when we make shows like Gomorrah and Redemption and the telenovelas we make, we don't have many. Um, for the luxury of something like music because we're on air every day and the cost to minute is very, very low in those shows, right? 
But we discovered really great talent from people that send us their music and say, please, I just want to have my track on one of your episodes. And they give us the license to use it and they push it to use it, right? Um, and sometimes I, I, I'm against the, the, uh, the culture of like exposure as currency. Um, and there is a cap to that, so you can't be living like that all the time. But you do also need to sort of be you know, generous with your skill set in some way to be seen. Um, and like Lindo said, like don't pay me, uh, just give me an opportunity to meet someone. Those are the things that are gonna really open the doors for you. Please don't send me anything like supplier forms, like, or an email, I, I can't, like, I, I just, I get too many emails of people introducing themselves, so it's very difficult to uh, make a relationship in that way. I think it's better if you say, oh, here's a song I have, um, I really love your show, Gomorra, can you put it on? Because now I'm starting a conversation with you, I'm going, oh, okay, cool, here's this guy, he's got this track, oh, maybe we can use it. And then, you know, as you grow, we grow alongside you, you know? Um, so that's my advice to get in, is to have come with something. There's two more questions here before we have to wrap it up. Yes, ma'am. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Matanda Shabonga, and I'm a student that I have um, is one about writing. So I studied drama um, at the University of Kosovo and learned, I don't think there was a time when we learned to write or anything other than theatre. So I then became a writer for theatre, obviously, the talking that you have in mind with the theatre. So I just want to know. Now I want to break into television writing. Um, what is um, the way to actually do that? Um, do you need to do a course um, specifically for that? Number one, if so, where? And um, number two, um, how do you get to write? Or also, um, put your stuff out there without having your stuff stolen. I know that you have to put stuff out there. say you're trying to advertise yourself. Uh, so with writing, I think uh, what's important, and it's actually for all the disciplines, so this is not just for writing, you need to find a head of department person. Don't come to Tsabang Bindo or myself. Like you, there's still another person that, I mean, we have head writers on our shows. Our head writers have relationships with people that they, that they are mentoring as well. So look at the credits and be like, oh, okay, this show was written by so-and-so, and this is the kind of show that I feel like I could offer something, and, you know, come with something. Say, can I sit in your writer's room for one day? I just want to see what a writer's room looks like, right? Um, or, I, I, you know, one thing for writers, they never have someone to take notes, so say, I just, I just want to come, and I'll take all your notes for you, just to make the relationship, and then you'll see what is required of you, and that person will give you much better advice than I like it's great, like because he's truthful. Uh, Lunati Mabov is truthful. Uh, Primo is truthful. Uh, Zekona Bali, all these are truthful actors who, in every single scene, bring something, and that's what we're looking for. And often, when we see bad performances, like they're trying too hard and you use things like it's fake or it's something off, it's because they're not truthful. Um, so that's really what we're looking for. And it's never personal when you don't get a role. It's just it wasn't your role. Uh, and, and I think every actor has a role, and it's not about being handsome or beautiful or having followers, it's about being truthful. Guys, thank you very much for affording your time on a Saturday. Guys, please give the loudest one of the day. Give a round of Hey man, yeah, <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that so much, was it good? Yeah, it was. Yeah, thank you brother, I appreciate you. It's still around. Cool, alright. Yeah, the master, the, um, 
what is the so I just thought about the fact that I want to give back especially after my directing career I've been directing for 22 years now and I just wanted to do something that was like selfless and prime back into the industry and something for the youth and I just wanted to take them on a journey of like me as a filmmaker, what I've been through, what I've done, the work I've done, and hopefully they can learn from that. I also had some panel discussions with Lian Kumalo, Lindo Langa, and then I had an actor's um, panel discussion. So I tried to take them through the journey and experience of what's behind camera and what's in front of camera. And do I think it was successful? The turnout was absolutely great. We had over 200 kids here. Ah, <laughs> all of my work is my favorite work because all, I did my work when I was in different parts of my life, different aspects, uh, in growth, who I am, my purpose, what I believe in myself. So I don't have my favorite work. I still think that my favorite work I'm still going to do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's say at Siriti Films, we've got, we've got some exciting telenovelas coming your way. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Being out here and thank, you thank you for having me, guys. God bless. Hi, I am with the one and only, the amazing. What's up, guys? My name is Wanda Wushin. I'm from Ash. I'm from Tim Ben. I'm from Instagram. And today, I just want to say to the great. Thank you. And uh, what are you looking forward to in this experience and what are you going to take away and all that stuff, you know? Okay, um, Tabak is doing tea bag, as we know, is doing a once in a lifetime free masterclass, ins and outs of the industry. And as somebody who's passionate about acting, TV presenting, guaranteeing the future, I am here to absorb as much of the And uh, yeah, I'm going to engage with people, build my network. And are your top three favorite Tabang produced or directed movies? Top three favorite um, productions by Tabang definitely Redemption. I love the series. Uh, it's doing wonders. Got so many nominations at the Saptors. Number two, for more, for more widely popular, Zones of Magic, Shooting for the Stars. Last but not least, his latest production in the Water Man. The premiere was amazing. Just saw some snippets in there. So that's definitely my top three bets of our Super, super great. Hi, my name is Dozum Laba. I'm a 23 year old writer and director, filmmaker and a cultural curator across multiple artistic disciplines of various communal spaces with the work that I do with my non-profit organization, Parati Artists. I'm, I'm always at these sessions to just keep on learning. I think you're always learning. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm a student of the craft. 
and been learning a few things, been getting a bit of insights and also meeting different professionals, different creatives um, who are peers and also people who are actually practitioners in the space. I mean, I've been doing it for a long, a long time. So I think these are the spaces where you come out and you network with people and you meet the people who are going to be making films in the next few years, you know. So, yeah, I'm just trying to meet some producers who are going to hire me in a few years. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know when this is coming out, but I just wrapped my short film and it's going to premiere um, probably in November. Um, so yeah, it's entitled The Passage, it's a gender-based violence film and yeah, if you're looking to support us, you can follow The Passage short film on Instagram or you can just follow Ndawazam Laba on Instagram and you'll find information about the film and the progresses um, thereof. So yeah, it's an independent short and we're really excited to kind of foster positive change in society through the arts. Thank you.